Alrighty, well, hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Anthony Campolo. I'm here repping JavaScript Jam, which is a podcast hosted by Edgio. If you check us out, we are the very bottom right corner there on the sponsors page. And we have Glauber here joining us Thank from you. Terso slash Chisel Strike. We'll talk a little bit. Yeah. Just Terso now. Chisel yeah. Strike is dead. No, it's not Never dead. to return. It's a company name, right? Just a. <laughs> It happens. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and explain to people what all these names mean. That's right. Thank you. So thanks for having me. And it is a pleasure and an honor to be recording a podcast with an audience. I know, Is this right? your first time as well? It is my yes, first yeah, time. Yes, yeah. First time hosting a live <laughs> podcast. I've been hosting so, podcasts yeah. for many, many years. But this is the first time doing one live. So very much appreciate you all joining us for this. Awesome. So thanks for having me. Yeah. So, um... Tell the audience a little bit about your background. You have an illustrious career in open source. You've worked on the Linux kernel. You've worked on Scylla DB. You've done a lot of really cool stuff. So why don't you give kind of a couple minute kind of compacted history of where you came from. Awesome. Uh, so I started my career around the year 2000. Uh, and this is one of the things we were talking about mm -hmm. today, like how at the time, much like today, everybody was kind of scared like because of the crisis and you know, 2001 was a bubble. I'm not going to go into was it bigger than today or not. Like everyone has <laughs> some opinion, but quite disastrous in a lot of senses as well. And I started my career essentially doing open source. Uh, I took a liking uh, to the Linux kernel. Mm -hmm. It is something that all my friends at the time told me not to do. Uh, the word that they used That's was, incredible. Like, yeah. <laughs> this is why I tell people don't take advice from people because people give overwhelmingly bad advice. <laughs> Yeah, and, and like the other thing about advice is that if you ask 10 people, you have 12 you get 10 different answers, right? yeah, totally, yeah. Uh, but the reason people told me back then, like, don't do it, and the words that they would use is like, this is completely stupid, this is like, this, this is the worst decision you Waste can ever make time. in your life, yeah. like, st that kind of flair. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is that, first of all, uh, it's an operating system, right? Mm -hmm. There's no innovation happening in operating systems, like, even if you like computers, uh, because on top of everything, I actually ended up graduating in CS, but I started um, in university, I was doing mechanical engineering, right? So I had to, I, took, I, I was doing this for because I liked it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, open source, uh, Linux, I just took a liking, really. Um, and so first of all, it's like, it's an operating system, even if you want to go more towards that, like, look at the web, look at the stuff, like, look at, etc. like, op what is the innovation, what kind of career can you build in mm -hmm. that? Uh, and second of all, it's open source. It's the worst idea the world has ever had. I mean, it's all free. How are you going to make money yeah, out of it? Who's going to work for and, free? And, who's ever going to do and that? And it's funny because, like, today this is such an established thing. Mm -hmm. It became the other way around. If you have infrastructure software like a database like we do today and you're not open source, people don't even look at you because there, then there's trust issues. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. But at the time, uh, the, the database that everybody used was Oracle. The operating system that everybody used was Microsoft Windows. Uh, it's like the worst of all worlds. <laughs> and... But it could have been Microsoft Access as the database. But like, um, it wasn't like it is today. So like, you're really going to bat your career uh, and change everything you're doing to go do like operating systems for free? That sounds stupid. Mm -hmm. But I guess I was stupid back then and paid off. <laughs> so I, I stayed around. Stupid like a fox. <laughs> yeah. Uh, much to uh, my detractors at the time. Surprise, uh, there was a company that started doing that was doing better and better and better. Um, and they had this idea that nobody truly understood that it was, we'll give you our software for free, and we're just going to charge you for it. The support of that software was called Red Hat. Mm. Um, and they just hired me out of my contributions for the Linux kernel, and there we had the money problem essentially solved it. It's mm. just to some extent, right? And I stayed, uh, I, I did some quite uh, some small things here and there for other companies, but Red Hat was the bulk of my Linux career. Overall, it lasted around 10 years. I was doing that around, up until 2012. And then I joined another startup. Another startup. Red Hat was not a startup. When, already when I joined, it was already like a, a public company, um, a small public company, but still. And then I joined a startup at the time uh, that was founded by the creator of the KVM hypervisor, with whom I became friends uh, through my Red Hat days. Uh, and what they were trying to do Docker was not a thing, containers were not a thing, and what we were trying to do at the time was something called the unikernel. And a unikernel mm, is a I've kernel that, that term before, yeah. Yeah, it's a kernel that can run a single thing at a time. I mean, just the, uh, and because of that, you've applied a bunch of optimizations, and the thinking behind it was you have 
everything is going to the cloud, everything is virtualized now. Mm -hmm. So instead of running Linux on top of Linux, uh, let's just run this other thing on top that we just wrote in C++ uh, called OSV, and it's, uh, it's going to be 20% faster, 30% faster, whatever, because you don't have this overhead of like a full operating system. Because at the end of the day, we noticed that people were running a single application per VM. Right? Yeah. That's mm -hmm. how they did it back then. Docker showed up, other things happened. I don't think people actually took a, a liking to the concept to begin with, that, ki that didn't quite work. And then we pivoted to a database company called Scylla. So at the, at the time, the company was called Cloudio Systems, right? Mm. And it pivoted to... It, yeah, because I've, I've heard of yeah. Scylla in the past. Like, yeah. I was someone who I studied databases a little bit a couple of years ago. Yeah. That was one that I, it came up frequently. Yes. And I think it was like a multimodal kind of database? Or? Uh, so... Some people are still are not that familiar with Scylla today, mm -hmm. you know, which is a shame, but like, lots of people are familiar with Apache Cassandra, right? so mm -hmm. you're probably familiar with Apache okay. Cassandra. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Scylla was, now it, it, it grew, it, it outgrew this concept to some extent, but what it was, it was a re-implementation of Apache Cassandra in C++. Mm -hmm. Okay, but, so wide column store. Yeah, gotcha. essentially the same. But, but not only was it C++, we were bringing a lot of techniques from like the kernel and stuff like that, mm -hmm. like direct I.O., like we were not using memory map files. and th That for the time and in, in where we were putting this thing was um, quite novel. Uh, and because of that, we could actually post performance numbers 10 times higher consistently, 10 and sometimes more higher than Apache Cassandra, and that was our play. Like, we're going to do this. Uh, so I stayed doing this for, I, I, I was always joking that back then, if you invited me to join a database company, my answer would have been, hell no. Uh, but then the database company joined me, in a sense, because yeah. I, you know, we, I joined a kernel operating system company, which is what I was trying so then, to do. So how does Scylla get to Chisel Strike? Uh, well, if, if at some point it just left, right? Uh -huh. And then uh, I wasn't a founder, but it was employee So you saw three. that you had database experience enough yeah. to where you felt that you could start your own database company. Um, broadly speaking, yes, there was a, I had a year at Datadog in the meantime. Okay. Um, that was in 2020. Mm -hmm. So driven by, I'm not going to put all the, into the pandemic, but to some extent, like I've, everything was changing very rapidly. I mean, everyone's uh, life. Was I like, was about. I feel like they yeah. have a pivot point at the pandemic one way or the that, other. <laughs> that is not why I left Scylla, but this is why I didn't start a startup right away okay. to some extent. Mm -hmm. right? So just, to, and, my, and my plan was like, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be here doing like a, you know, maybe couple of years, three, four so years. So did you just have the idea yourself you wanted to build a company or it was an opportunity kind of presented to you? It was both. I always wanted to build a company. There are always something that I wanted to do. But in my timeline, it was going to be after three years of data dog, four years of data dog, something like that. But then an opportunity arose for us to found Chisel Strike. And just because you mentioned, like the idea of Chisel Strike was a, like we had this understanding that like a, with platforms like, like Cloudflare becoming dominant, mm -hmm. um, database decisions were not made by the same people that was made before. Like when we were selling Scylla. Did you feel like the, the DBA is dying? Well, I mean, all, all those things about this is dying, this is dying, nothing in our industry truly dies. But do you feel right? like the, the, the DBAs have yeah. a monopoly on database decisions? Yeah, exactly, right? And, and, and that's the best way to frame it. Like it used to be the case, like when we sold Scylla, and I mean, I'm an engineer by trade. Again, as I said, I spent 20 years essentially doing heavy, low-level coding. But I took a liking as well to just go do business. And when, at Scylla, when we started gaining customers, I wanted to be close to those customers that are helping them in any way I can. So I helped the marketing team. Uh, obviously, needless to say, the CEO loved me because mm -hmm. <laughs> I was always uh, involved with marketing, with sales, with support, and et cetera. Came, coming from this background of like deep engineering, I wrote large parts of the database. So I knew I, I, I was already in a position to help those folks. And every time we sold into a deal, again, the profile of the person involved in that decision was very similar, which mm -hmm. it's not, it wasn't already a DBA. Uh, it was more like a for DevOps persona or infrastructure persona, right. but it wouldn't be you, right? Mm -hmm. Like as a, as a front end or application developer. And what we started to notice is that with platforms like Cloudflare as I said, becoming dominant, you have now an application developer that say, hey, I don't need to manage my whole backend anymore. I can just start firing those functions, uh, which is great. But then the next step is that this person now is so much closer to the database decision that like, 
they might as well start making the database decisions. And we're seeing this more and more, like those persons, their application developers, making some of the database mm -hmm. decisions, not all. On top of that, um, Cloudflare has a very, and obviously there are other players, uh, but we do mm -hmm. consider Cloudflare to be the main player here. Sure. Uh, they have this edge story of like mm -hmm. you're, you're moving this data everywhere, right? N not the data, but the, your compute is going everywhere. Yeah, yeah, the data part is, is yeah. the hard part, whatever yeah. we're trying to figure out right yeah. now. <laughs> and, 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 you know, which is eventually what we're trying to do. But yeah. like, a, mm -hmm. so you have this idea, like those are, this is a different persona. Um, and there is a different characteristic in this market, which is like this thing really needs to be at the edge. And again, we have this thesis from day one, which is why I still talk about it. And that didn't change. And this is the part where you're all allowed to laugh at me. And <laughs> starting Let's with get you. ready. We thought, like, imagine, I always think of that meme, of that guy carrying the skateboard. Uh -huh. Hey, kids. Hello, like guy, fellow kids. Yeah, hello, fellow <laughs> kids. Like, because it's a bunch of, like, low-level kernel nerds. Yeah. Like, like he saying, hello, fellow database yeah. developers. <laughs> hello, fellow front-end developers. So yeah. our, our initial approach of Chisel Strike was a little bit like that. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, fellow, how about uh, I give you a database? Because you're a front-end developer. You probably don't like SQL because you're telling me you hate databases, right? Because you don't understand no, I'm a front-end developer. I'm using Prisma. I'm not yeah. writing any SQL. Well, yeah, but, you know, Prisma is still SQL in, in a sense that, like, a... I mean, it's it's a uh, it's an ORM, so it's yeah. like you're, yeah. you you turned into so you write raw SQL. Yeah. And, Most and, of our and, people and again, aren't writing a SQL query using my, Prisma. In my defense, we knew that, for example, uh, people like ORMs, mm -hmm. uh, and people don't like databases uh, from the application world. Right. Yeah. And look, it's not a, it's not that I like databases. As I said, like uh, they're that you need a database. <laughs> no one wants a yeah. database. They need a need, database. <laughs> not even I like databases, but uh, but. What we thought is that what if we get a database and an ORM bundled together, in a, and we built this thing around SQLite as well, um, to the extent that like, instead of doing SQL, um, you have a, a, a layer on top of that that you can essentially do TypeScript. So we, we, we found a way to put Dino and SQLite put together. And this is now your compute and data. And you can just program your database uh, you start from TypeScript types, something similar to what Drizzle is doing, for example. We didn't sure, have a code yeah. generation mm -hmm. step. You, you define your database types in TypeScript. We do all the migrations automatically. Yeah, because then you like, get end-to-end -end type yeah, safety if you're using TypeScript uh, on the front yeah. end, and then you get nice autocomplete and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And it got some interest, but never like the amount of traction that we would have liked. And mm -hmm. moreover, every time we went to talk to my fellow front-end developers, mm -hmm. uh, what, what I kept hearing is that this is cool. Like, nobody ever told us this is not cool. But, like, I kind of like to have a SQL layer that is well-defined. Um, and moreover, like, we had a lot of, even the platform that we focused the most of the time, which was Cloudflare, we had a lot of trouble integrating with Cloudflare because people would ask us, okay, so do I, how do I deploy this on Cloudflare? And I would have to explain to them, no, you don't deploy this on Cloudflare because, again, we have our own runtime. Yeah, and, and I'm yeah. so let's, let's get into, like, SQLite here because Cloudflare now does have a SQLite kind of yeah. thing, and a lot of, a lot of companies are trying to figure out how to put SQLite on the edge. So yeah. let's, let's hone into that and be like, why SQLite? Yeah. Um, but but just, to, just to finish this, I mean, and then we, asked, we were always talking to those folks. They would mm -hmm. say, this is cool and all, but, but I... I don't like this, I don't like that. I mean, but the SQLite stuff you guys are doing is pretty cool, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So we started noticing that, 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 <laughs> that the interest was, was around that. Uh, and funny enough, we were actually not doing it that much because we were doing it very, like we were really focusing on the API. We're like, we're gonna figure out the data distribution later, mm -hmm. right? And, and then, you know, this later never came because uh, we were so focused on, on getting the API right. And at some point we just decided, look, let's put a product out that, so let's do now sit down together, uh, go do a couple of months of uh, really like all the company focus together. Uh, let's put a product out that is just the database layer, remove the API stuff, uh, and see what happens. It was extremely successful, right? So just that that's why, uh, and we've been talking like essentially, it's a story very similar to the story that I had in Silla. You try something, I mean, you had some usage, it doesn't quite work, but you just see what uh, happens. Out, of, out of that comes something, right, that, that, that you really want to. Um, selling, you know, you always want to sell everything, but the question is, like, do people want to buy? Yeah. Uh, but now, to your question, why SQLite? And 
just a clarification, what we run is not actually SQLite. This is something that lots of people don't know, but SQLite is a technically open source project. Mm -hmm. I mean, spiritually open source project, but not, not technically, because they're actually public domain. So technicality, but they're not licensed at any open source license. The code is just public domain. It doesn't have a copyright. That sounds way better. It is, in some senses, way better. Um, from, from your usage point of view, is way better. But they're not open contribution. Which, right, then this, which, is, this is an important point, is yeah. that just because everyone can see the code doesn't mean anyone's yeah. allowed to actually make a change yeah. to the code. And they say it, and they say it on their website, like, it, this is not open contribution. And we were seeing all of those companies, as you said, like looking at SQLite for the edge. We were not the only ones, by and large. And they're all dancing around the fact that, hey, I wish I could change SQLite to do, make it do... So a people want to be able yeah. to kind of fork it and do yeah. whatever they want with it. But, but I don't want to fork it because it's like a... Yeah, because then you lose any up, you, up, yeah, I forgot how to upstream it. It's whatever, like a huge yeah. Mess. And, yeah. And it's just, so I'm going to build something around it. That's what everybody was doing. I think we're just crazy. I don't know. We just said, <laughs> I just forked this thing. Uh, and as so, I said, you, so you did fork it? I did fork it. Yeah. Okay, so, cool. So what we're running... Did you give it a cool name when you forked it? Leap SQL. Leap SQL. Yeah, so if you go All to right. your website... We are, we, we are telling people that, yeah, this is SQLite. We want to, the, the delta in code between those two things are very small. Mm -hmm. um, it will grow over time, I believe. We're still back merging from SQLite. We want to keep, SQLite is also, again, uh, comparing to Linux, it's a very small <laughs> code base. I mean, sure, yeah, felt, anything uh, compared to Linux is yeah, going to be similar. Well, <laughs> But like SQL is relatively simple, like so it felt like, a, and I personally don't like forks. The reason I don't like forks is that uh, in Linux, uh, soft forks were very well received. Like let me fork this stuff and go explore this so stuff. It's like, a, it's like a distro. Yeah, but hard forks were not, and the reason for that is that it fragments the community. Right, and then you end up with different people working on but there is similar no, things. Yeah. You rebuild stuff a million but times. But there is no community with SQLite. Of developers. When I say community here, I mean developers, yeah. right? Which is so interesting because it's allegedly, yeah. what I've heard, the most used database in the world. It is, yes. Yeah. Yes. And that's kind of incredible. But, but then again, no this, is why, this is why the public, the, 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 the public domain thing gets tricky. Because, to, again, this is according to the website, but one of the reasons they're not open contribution is to be able to make sure that they're public domain. Because if you take a contribution from somebody else, then like, you need a license. It's, it's harder. It, it, uh, that's what open source licenses are designed to do. Like, here's this mm -hmm. license, right? They're just yeah, so they okay, can't I, use. I have lots of thoughts on yeah. open source licenses. They, they, that's, they that's can have. They can use third party code, etc. <laughs> and like, we just forked it, and then we added a bunch of functionality that we believe is important for for the edge. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them is a much easier and robust way to tap into the stream of changes of SQL, like called the write ahead log, um, and we built a distributed service around it. And why, why is it that, to finally answer your question, I did warn you that I talk a lot, right? So to, <laughs> no, to, finally, to finally answer your question of why SQLite, be it our fork or, or SQLite or whatnot, um, people keep asking me what is the difference between the, the cloud and the edge? Yeah, so, yeah there's a, a whole discussion right it's now. It's serverless <laughs> around the, the edge. The honestly, about whether you use yeah, edge and edge or time, and yeah, it's look, complicated. It's um, fair. Right? I think as a community, as an industry, we, we're used to people just tossing out buzzwords out there. Yeah. So it is a fair concern. But I do view the edge and the cloud as very different uh, sure. for yeah. two the, reasons. And the way I would, and before you say that, yeah. I would say the cloud is someone else running your server. The edge is someone else running your server all across the world close to the users. Um, well, it's part, it's, I think it's part of that. It's not only that you're running the service, but if you think... The analogy that I like to use is that when you move from data, private data centers to the cloud, it was not only like who runs it and who, and who owns it that change. It was the fact that a abstraction layer around provisioning service, service changed so radically that enabled different use cases. And, and in that case of the cloud is the fact that I could commission a service and wait a week versus now in the cloud I can commission a service and wait Five minutes right, back yeah. then, right? Uh, so this changes the way you build your applications. And what I see with the edge is that I could go on AWS and build a service in five different regions. But I have to be very aware 
of the fact that I'm doing this. Yeah, you got to so, click up and write. Yeah, you got to pick yeah. your and region. And exactly. if you build it in one, you want to tear it down in another. You got to go back to and your the region. Application has to be, and the application has to be very aware of mm -hmm. the fact that yeah. this is happening. So this awareness disappears with the edge because what the edge enables you to do is write an application that's truly global and you don't care as the application writer where what is going to happen so it's not just the fact that the servers are now spread around it is the fact that you have this abstraction layer that removes this concern from your mind and the second thing which is a result of that to some extent is that if you really want to put servers in all of those locations, you can put AWS US East 1 in 100 places. It's, at the end, it's a data center, right? So you, mm -hmm. you build this abstraction layer, and then you put 100 massive data centers on top. How much is this going to cost? It costs a lot. So the reason, the reason people don't put 100 big data centers out there is not because it's not technically possible. It's because it's not economically feasible. Mm -hmm. So the edge has fewer resources available to you. And SQLite is the database that really allows you to use those resources in the best way. It is a cheap database to run. It is a, a, a very efficient database to run. Uh, just to, I mean, we'll, we'll get in more details to Turso in our offering hopefully soon, but I, uh, I can run you in, uh, with the limits that we're going to put on the website, which is around like 10 billion uh, rows read per month. I can run you in 34 locations for less than $200, right? Mm -hmm. So if you want to put uh, MySQL in 34 locations, it's going to cost you a little bit more than $200, right? So, and, and again, why is that? Because we can run this on very, uh, very efficient memory footprint. We can use this like in, in very efficient uh, compute substrates. Uh, so it's very efficient to run. And everybody kind of knew that, which is why I believe everybody's chasing, was chasing the thing about, hey, SQLite. And again, I think what we did differently uh, is that we just forked it. Uh, our fork, by the way, is fully open contribution. Uh, okay. We don't want us to be the only company and, and group contributing to that. We actually are welcoming. Are there other companies that are using it? Uh, there is another company that is finishing their contribution to enable CRDTs in LibSQL natively, which I love, which is, a, again, which is an offer that soon, uh, hopefully, we're going to be able to even offer for two, we haven't really figured out yet. CRDTs, for those who you don't know, is essentially a conflict. I, I always forget. The conflict acronym. something data type. Data type. Conflict, <laughs> conflict free replicated data types. And what it allows you to do is like, a, it's one, something in between eventual consistency, which was like the All I know model. is it's the thing that makes something like Google Docs work. Yeah. You, you could use CRDTs for yeah, that, right? Exactly. And it's a little bit stronger than eventual consistency, but not as strong in terms of consistency than like, consistent SQL database. Um, and again, this is fairly interesting, I think, for the edge. This, this company is not affiliated with us. Uh, they've been con contributing things to that. Uh, we have other things that we contributed ourselves, let's say to kickstart the community. Uh, they're not immediately useful for Turso, although it might be one day. For example, uh, you can write uh, WebAssembly user-defined functions in our fork of mm -hmm. SQLite. Uh, which I believe is quite interesting as well. Uh, but we, we, can, we just forked it and we built a service around it. That service uh, keeps the same developer experience of SQLite. And what that means is that you can develop everything locally, you can test your database locally, you can put your database in your CI with local database files. And to do that, you just write in your client connection, file, colon, and the name of the file. But then if you go to the same client, and I'll do HTTPS, and then the address of your Turso database, now you're deployed at the edge. Uh, and we do all the routing for you as well, which is, again, really relying on what I believe to be the defining characteristic of the edge. Mm -hmm. You replicate it in all of those locations, but your client doesn't have to choose the location. Like, if you're running on Cloudflare, like the Cloudflare, uh, you're going you're gonna, to, from your workers, you're going to fire a request to a single URL. that is a Turso URL. And we will figure out what is the replica that's closest to you, uh, and then you can create more replicas, ad, ad, ad hoc replicas. I mean, creating a replica is very easy. And that's the core of the yeah. data at the edge yeah. problem. We, we, we focus a lot on making the experience of bringing up a new location uh, extremely easy. So you can say, well, um, let's say I want to be really efficient and spend as little money as possible, and I want to run six, five regions. 
But then now I, I start noticing that there's a bunch of users coming from Japan, and I create a new location in Japan. Mm -hmm. It takes you a couple of seconds, right? Awesome. Uh, so this is how we're focusing on, on, on building this product, because we, we really... Cool. I'm going to pause you right here. Um, yeah. Is Kent or Igor here? Yeah. Awesome. Were, we, were you going to get you up here? That was a... Just want to, I'm just thinking about time right now, so I just want to make sure I'm we, managing like, we that can't correctly. See so um, who's who, right? I'll, get, I'll give this another five or ten minutes, then we can get you up here. Sure. Awesome. So you want to talk to the sound guys, make sure you get a headset and all that. Um, does anyone in the crowd have a question right now? If anyone wants to ask questions, we love to make this interactive, so feel free, just throw your hand up and I'll call on you. Otherwise, we'll just keep keep rolling here. All right, cool, great. Go ahead, continue. That's doing. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's it. That's the offer. We have a booth uh, right outside. Uh, for awesome. So how would a developer get started? If they wanted to build something right now, what's the best way to get started with Terso? The best way to get started, you go, you go to terso.tech. It's T-U-R-S-O dot tech. And you're going to sign up with your GitHub account to our free tier. Our free tier is going to give you three locations I already. I stuff. Out mm -hmm. of the... <laughs> I don't, I don't actually. <laughs> even, even You're like giving a, away your work yeah, for free? What? <laughs> it is a, I'm not going to go there because I, mean, I talk a lot. But, but essentially, because this is the same social media stuff. Like, uh, we have a free tier, which is different than our product is free, so I kind of tolerate that. But like, I don't like free products because like, it's not free. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing so free. Nothing, nothing in life is free. <laughs> so I mean, you, you, you're selling your soul. No free lunch. Worse, but that. Uh, again, a free tier is different. It's essentially like a limited way for you to get acquainted with the platform. So you, by signing up and you start using the free tier, our free tier is going to include a billion rows read a, a month. A billion with yeah. a B. With a B. Wow. A month. It's not that impressive, to be honest. Because it's like <laughs> I was, somebody was like, it's a billion. So I can give you 12 billion a year. Or I could give you 110 billion, 20 billion yeah, I don't in 10 even, years. I don't even know. These numbers <laughs> are meaningless to me. <laughs> but like, uh, it's uh, other databases, like, it's, people like to talk into the billions because sure, yeah. it's a wow. But, um, and three locations. So, again, for, for free, from the start, we're already talking about something that you can run uh, in the United States, in Europe, and in Asia, for example, with a free database, right? Um, and in Hopefully, around the month, we're going to have a plan for $29 uh, dollars a month that you can run from six locations with larger allowances as well. Very cool. We have a Discord channel. I'm not going to Yeah, feel free. That, we're, uh, we're about to switch out yeah. here. But um, yeah, feel free to give any links or how people can find you or anything like that. Do I stay or do I go? Um, like I mean, you can stay, yeah, if you want to participate for, for sure. But um, yeah, just go ahead and give some links about how to find it. And then we'll um, transition to Igor. Awesome. Oh, nice to see you, Gary. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> yeah, hey, what's up, man? Hey, I'm good. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I'm not sure if your mic is on yet. Yeah. Go ahead and just hello, give him a little check hello, check. Hello. One, there we go. Two, one, two. Okay. Yeah, cool. sounds good. Yeah. So, yeah, feel Hi. free to introduce yourself and let our audience know who you are and what you do. Cool. Thanks for having me. So, my name is Igor. Um, I'm with Cloudflare, uh, and I do web stuff. So web stuff. Today... Here at Remix, um, think we all do web stuff here. <laughs> we do all. All of us do web stuff. Uh, in the past, I've done Angular for over a decade. Um, I wrote so my first line of Angular code just a month ago. Oh, actually. But the, <laughs> you, do you know Brandon Roberts? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah. yeah oh my yeah. God! Everyone I knows Brandon him. if you're into Angular. <laughs> yeah, he's awesome. Analog, analog, yeah, that's yes, right. Analog. We need more, more of like projects like analog. Yeah, I'm hyped on Angular. analog. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, I spent more than a decade at Google uh, working on the front end um, infrastructure, Angular, mm -hmm. and other things. And about a year and a half ago, I joined Cloudflare to refocus a little more, not, not necessarily like abandon the client side, but expand the client side, bring it to the server side, and combine the two together. Okay. Because I definitely started to see that um, we were exhausting the possibilities on the client side. and. There was so much to be gained by uniting the client side and server side in mm -hmm. a way that hasn't been done before. And it was the edge computing that enabled it. Uh, and Cloudflare is one of the really cool companies in that space, even though it's not so well known for edge computing. I don't uh, disagree. I would say that Cloudflare workers is the vast majority of people are introduced to the idea of edge functions by Cloudflare workers. I'm surprised to hear that. And I would, I would agree with him. Okay, just, cool. Just, <laughs> it's, 
I think there are people in the community that are aware of workers and Cloudflare workers and edge computing, but it's definitely not the mainstream understanding today. Hmm. Um, Interesting. But I think that's going about to change. Uh, so what do you do specifically? Are you on a specific team on Cloudflare or a specific product? I or? work on the developer platform, development platform uh, team. So okay. I'm with my colleague Nivi here, and together we work on um, anything developer related. So, my so like, do you interface with like pages or something like that? Yes, pages fall into my purview. Cool. Uh, I've got to sign on pages. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So pages, workers, um, D1, R2, Wrangler. Yeah, um, D1 being a Terso competitor, <laughs> technically. Friend, yes, we're friends. We're friends. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's so, SQLite so, on the edge, like by definition, is kind of a competitor. You can say that it's a it's competition. Yes, I, I think it's right to say that it's a competition, but. We don't see... And I don't mean competitor in an animosity way, you know, just that you're, yeah, you're building exactly, a, a exactly. similar thing that so could solve a similar problem. Actually, we're fighting after... This, you know, <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> selling, <laughs> selling tickets. Uh, <laughs> no. We're covering ourselves with mud and we're just going to... The, the reason why we're doing D1, the main motivation here is we want to build awesome primitives, mm -hmm. low-level primitives that make something like D1 possible. And the best way to do that is actually to try to build a higher level product and then derive what the primitives should be. Mm -hmm. And our goal is to actually expose the primitives to everybody so that anybody can build something like D1 on top of the primitives. Because gotcha. the thing that we have that, that is very unique to us is this infrastructure that is global, uh, that we've been building over 13 years. We have 200, over 275 data centers around the world mm -hmm. um, with a lot of capacity, both in terms of CPU, memory, as well as bandwidth. Uh, we have so much bandwidth that we give away a lot of it for free. Uh, we build R2, which is a clone of S3. Yeah, I've got an R2 blog post free, in the works right now. <laughs> because we don't need to charge people for egress. We have so much bandwidth, we can right, just give yeah. it away. Um, we, we want people to come and, and uh, build on top of us and either build applications like use Remix and deploy it directly to us. Or we are looking for partners that are interested in building um, their solutions, like Turso or others, on top of the primitives that we offer. So I'd be curious then, he was talking about SQL and SQLite and how it's this weird kind of open source community managed, like gray area type thing. So yeah. have you had to deal with that as well? A little bit, but I'm actually, I, didn't know about this fork, so this whole discussion is very well, Matt, Matt knew, he should have told you. Should, should <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not deeply involved in yeah. the D1 project. I'm helping with the DX and, and some of the integrations, okay, sure, but yeah. not, in, not necessarily with the, the implementation. So that, that is not my area of expertise, but I'm, I'm glad to hear yeah. that there is a fork that is welcomes open source contributions. You know, I spent over a decade on Angular, and it was always open contributions. We, we build Angular with the community mm -hmm. for the community. Yeah. Uh, it was not a Google project. They were, we, we just were secretly well, writing code. Well, it's not code. dead yet, so it couldn't have been. Yeah, so uh, that's, that's the true open source. That's how, how you do open source. Uh, it, it does take extra energy but it makes the project more resilient. So what are you working on right now in Cloudflare that you're excited about and you want people to know about? Oh my gosh, so much. Uh, how many beans can I spill? Uh, all the beans, That's, all is, the is beans. This is the bean spilling well, arena. When is this going to be released, this recording? Um, a week <laughs> we or have two. A big, yeah. We have a big announcement, uh, a week full of announcements coming up starting Sunday. Okay, it'll so, be after that. Yeah. Okay, so so on Sunday we'll be announcing. Lots you guys are of getting the hot things. gossip right now. Uh, one of the cool things that we announced um, today, pre-announced today, was smart placement. Um, smart so what? Smart placement. Okay. So, Nevi, Nevi and I, uh, my my colleague, um, we gave a presentation here at Remix uh, about Edge. What is Edge? Uh, what is it good for? And just real quick, I work at a company called Edgeo. We do a lot of edge stuff. So yeah, I give a quick plug. Continue. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is it good for? How do you use it? And when you should not use it? Right. Um, yeah. That's, and that's the big yeah. question because that there's is, this push to edge everything, yeah, yeah. and that might not necessarily be the right thing to do. It's, 
sometimes it's a terrible idea. Right, yeah. Um, if, if you foolishly go and just follow buzzwords and, and just like be like, let's do Edge for the sake of Edge, mm -hmm. it might not end up well. And one of the solutions is actually Remix use cases. Uh, when you have an application like Remix um, and you want to do server-side rendering, then if you deploy it to the Edge, the server-side rendering happening at the Edge may or may not be a good idea, and it depends on where your data lives. Well, with Turso, it lives close to it. Well, <laughs> so that, that's what I'm saying. Like, it depends yeah, on where your exactly, data lives. Yeah. Most applications today, most companies, have centralized data stores. Right. They might live in AWS or GCP, but it's pretty much locked into one location. In the worst case, it's on-premise in some closet <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> that you manage. Too many companies have that situation. So you have data in one location if server-side rendering is happening at the edge. Now, imagine the situation where you have your Remix application deployed to the edge. Uh, your, your database is in US East, and your user is in India. You provision the compute in India. You load the Remix application. The Remix application wakes up. And the Remix application starts talking to the database in US East. And it doesn't take one database uh, request to render a Remix application. It's many of them, uh, depending on the complexity of the application. So now you're paying for the latency from the edge to US East over and over for yeah, every and this single This is the most important thing is understanding where do these bottlenecks actually come in and what is the bottleneck exactly. and how do you manage it. So if you foolishly run to the, to the edge and deploy your Remix application on the edge while your data is centralized, your application may work great if you as a user are near the data, because then the compute is provisioned near you, which then happens to be near data. But if you as a user are far away from the data, then the compute is provisioned near you, but the compute needs to talk to the database far, far uh, away. And that results in, in lots of bottlenecks and bad performance. Yeah, so even, even though my product is designed to address exactly this question, I fully agree, I fully agree with How that. Convenient. So no, you, no, you have two options. Basically, either bring data to the edge, which is what Turso is doing. Yeah, right. Turso is a way to bring data to the edge. Mm -hmm. um, it's great for some use cases. It's great mm -hmm. for greenfield projects. It's great for if you can quickly migrate to this kind of different, slightly different mm -hmm. data model. But some companies just have ginormous databases. Yes. And, and database even, sales cycles are sometimes things that take years. Yep, and it's, yeah, it's, it's they're locked so, into yeah, their totally, Oracle, yeah. uh, whatever agreement they have, license they, they bought for the next five years. So for the next five years, they'll have this database that they already paid for, and there's almost no way that they'll abandon it because mm -hmm. it, it would just not make sense. So you either bring data to the edge or you slightly abandon the edge and move the compute closer to data. Mm. And that's the thing we, we talked about today in our talk. And what we refer to that is smart placement. Okay. So with Cloudflare... Just real quick, there, we're going to be closing out in the next five, 10 minutes. So if people do have questions, now would be the time. So feel free to raise your hand <laughs> if you got one. Continue. Cool. So Cloudflare, for the longest time, was edge computing, really just happening at the edge. Uh, mm -hmm. We had few th products like um, durable objects where it might, the compute was necessarily at the edge. But with the, with the feature that, it, and it's really a feature that we, we are um, announcing, the, all the existing applications that you're deploying to Cloudflare today, whether it's workers or pages, you can opt in to this smart placement mode. And rather than that, compute being always provisioned at the edge. We will start monitoring the application, watch it for a few requests, and then we'll see, oh, this is a Remix application. It's talking to this database in US East. Let's always place it or provide instantiate it in US East near the database, regardless of where the user is entering. So if the user is in India, they will ingress, they will inter enter the Cloudflare network in India in the nearest data center that we own there, mm -hmm. and they will create this magic tunnel all the way to US East where uh, we'll spawn the application. The application will talk to the database very quickly, will generate the response, and the response is then relayed back to India. But this only happens for like server-side rendering. If you're doing static asset hosting, that still happens at the edge because edge for static asset hosting is the best place to host it. 
Mm -hmm. So depending on the use cases, this is why it's called smart because we observe and determine when is it when is it. Yeah, you decide the right so the developer thing. doesn't have to. Exactly. So right. the developer okay. doesn't need to think about regions. The developer yeah. doesn't. I don't have think, to think you're bending the edge because in the definition that I gave about the edge, that's exactly what it is. The fact that you can now write this global application without you worrying yeah. about this stuff because the platform does it for you. Yeah, this is where edge is a cool buzzword because nobody can agree on what the heck it is. Yeah, it's a, it's a little bit of a cluster <laughs> trying to figure out what all these, all these buzz terms mean. Well, thank you so much. I'm really glad we got to have this conversation with both of you because you're working on such uh, compatible uh, yeah. tech. So before we close it out, um, let everyone know where can they find you on the socials. Let's start with uh, Clobber. Uh, I am at Twitter at GLCST. That's my handle. And uh, also follow Torso Database. All right, and Igor? Cool. You can just go to igor.dev, I-G-O-R. You got igor.dev? Yeah. That's a sweet domain. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, easy. Cool, and thank you so much, everyone who was here to watch this. This was super fun, and um, thank you to Remix Comp for hosting us. And I think this is going to close it out for us. So, thank you thank very you, much. Anthony. Thank, thank you, Anthony. Thank you. Thanks a lot, man.